bring him in. That guy's set up. I don't know. It's where there he is. Ah, Look at him. Is that the pride of Potsdam, New York? Potsdam. Are you thinning is... and graying? What is going on? Oh, come on. Rats. Seven in a row, Rhett. That's not, that's not <laughs> easy on me. Oh, shit. <laughs> Daryl Sutter's not easy on anyone. <laughs> Was it easier as a player or when you, when your management no, get me some fucking players <laughs> management's easier because you can just go scout five nations <laughs> yes, tournament, and five tournament. Nations. Yeah. You, you notice how I'm here right mm -hmm. now. Uh, so definitely easier in a management. Cause I don't have to go down there. At I least can avoid though, the place. At least if you're a player, you could have some say in ending that streak. You're, you're like, I, I can't go lace them up Daryl. Like, what do you want me to do? I can't feed Hubert out here. Yeah. When you're watching in that, Puck goes over to Kopitar and you're thinking, really, are we going to give up a three goal lead with 10 minutes ago? This hey. is not good. There, there are way like, more. There's way more. You get up by two goals nowadays. It doesn't feel like it's at all insurmountable. Rhett said this the other day, and it's I true. saw it from uh, NHL PR. As of like four days ago, there were 20 instances this year of two goal leads in the third evaporating, and that was about the one month mark of the season. So that means twice every three nights in the NHL, someone's come back from two down in the third. And and I thought Rhett, I was like, oh, is that anecdotal or is it real? That's nuts. So like that doesn't that's not supposed to happen that often. Connie, have you noticed this? Uh, I mean, I agree. I mean, you look at Vancouver and us alone. You feel like, oh man, we're giving up two. They're giving up too. And there's lots, yeah, there's lots of teams that are doing it, but it's like, I just don't know why. I mean, I just can't figure it out, put my finger on it, but you know, obviously. I'll let you there's... finish that story, by the way. If Kopitar, if that save doesn't happen, and if Kopitar scores, are we going to give up a three? What happens when you go downstairs? Well, don't, you don't go downstairs. You don't You go. just don't go downstairs. <laughs> you know, that's, I don't go downstairs after games anymore anyways. It's just uh, easier to go to my office and, yeah. and then watch another game or wait for so, traffic to clear out. And... So the joy of being part of a team has been ripped from your soul because you're too scared <laughs> to go downstairs. Yeah, pretty much. It's a, mean, distant, it's, it's a distant association. I'm associated with the team. I don't want to be too close to it. But you know how it is, you know, there oh, yeah. after a game, it's so emotional down there and everybody's, yeah. you know, players, coaches, the staff, it's, it's just, it's almost just easier to see them the next day, you know, go down the next day and everyone's kind of digested what happened, good or bad, but it, you know, we won both games. So I got back, uh, just in time for, uh, you know, the Saturday game, I was in Plymouth at the five nations get back. So to see two wins was, was great. You know, I missed some of those games on the road because I was watching games. So I didn't really get to see exactly what yeah. happened. So, uh, and, and I know everyone says, oh, you go watch. No, I don't watch the, when we lose, I don't go watch the games. You do get a report from the coaches who they thought played well, what, what kind of synopsis of what happened. And then, uh, so are you with the on. team a lot on the road? Because I was thinking if you're on the road, you really can't avoid them then. Cause you're getting on the bus and then the plane. There has to be some almost nearer interaction. Oh, you know, I mean, like, yeah, a lot of times he's fine. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's game day. Hey, Rhett, it's probably game day is the day he's most intense. Well, so, it's old... and obviously when you lose, that's, he's intense. All yeah, he's yeah. intense a lot, but game days are the most intense. It's the old 24 hour rule. You gotta, he's because if it's 24 hours before a game, you gotta start getting ready for it. It just goes like ramping up and up and up. It's hard to keep up with Big D in the intensity level. 24 hour rule when you're playing every other day. So, what you've got about a yes. two hour window in there yes. between it's yes. too close to game day and too right. Well, hang on, they got two days, two games. You got you got a one day, you can live your life this road trip. <laughs> It's, as you it's come off gone. after a game, yeah. yeah. If as you come off after a game, if you've won, you have twenty minutes in the dressing room to enjoy it, and then get your head screwed on straight, boys. We got a game coming up. Rhett would dance for ten minutes of that, so come we on. had a Rhett dance, <laughs> a couple songs, and then yeah, he's kind of right. Yeah, and then it's back to business. So Daryl missing the press conference after the victory over the Kings. You mentioned that lovely save from Mark Schmidt. Total coincidence, right? I mean, it was just it was probably Ryan Huska's turn. <laughs> like I, did, I don't know, I wasn't down there signing autographs. Maybe Daryl ran upstairs to sign some autographs. Yeah, I was just so happy with the win. I wasn't even worried yeah. about. Ah, 
whatever, you know, that, that was the most important thing. Was just think, getting the two points. I think it was last year he sent LaBarbera in and it was clear, like La Barb's had the, the deer in the headlights. Like I just got told a moment ago, I'm talking to the media. And it was the first time Daryl didn't come out. <laughs> I, I mean, I, his, his pedigree, you cannot question. There's two rings, obviously. He's going to the Hall of Fame, but like, can you give us more context on, like, this is an incredibly unique and competitive driven guy. Like, give us a little more on, on, on what that building is or isn't like when things are going good, bad, other. It's kind of what you see. I mean, when you see his interviews, when you see his body language, his mood, his, the way he is, that's the way he is in the room. You know, so it's hard, it's hard to put into words, you know, and Rhett, maybe Rhett has a better way to do it. You know, he's, he's all about winning. Nobody's off limits. You know, everyone's in the, which is good. You know, you don't say, okay, he's got a few favorites. No, he doesn't have a few favorites. He just expects a lot and he demands a lot and it's, it's a lot Yeah, no. <laughs> and it's intense. Yeah. You know, it's hard to, it's hard to put in. You know, but uh, his practices are, are good. They're quick. You know, you, you know what you're doing when you're when you're playing for Daryl. You know what Daryl expects, and that's one nice thing about playing for him. Uh, you, there's not a fine line where you're thinking, "I wonder if Daryl's happy with my game." No, no, you know if Daryl's happy yeah. with your game or not happy, and what's you need to do to get back in the good books. So, it's 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 what, what, coaching, I guess, one on one. I mean, I wouldn't coach my kids like that, but definitely uh you know it's it and he'll say it's a job yeah. we're not here to have fun all the time we're here to work and, and win games that's it well, one of the things that and you can't it's like now you got to turn yourself back up there retro well, they try, i know you they are it down. It down. i know but it's it's just because you were you're animated and you're up you're good and you can come uh, a little closer okay, okay there we go there we go so they uh, all good. one of the things that Again, it's I, I don't know what the word I'm searching, for, but Daryl picks up on things that nobody else does, right? Like he'll read a room differently than you or I will, or he'll walk through it and he'll hear different things or see different things or sense different things. And he and it, it's his instincts, I think, that are hard to understand, right? Like he'll pick up on something and it might be driving him crazy, and no one else in the room would even know it was happened. Right, like little things that that he will pick up on that other guys don't even notice or see or care about. He will, I don't know what the word is, but he will break. That's part of his his whole philosophy is reading that room and having those little tendencies that he notices and sees in a practice, in a preparation, in the gym, behind the scenes where we don't we don't get to see guys. He picks up on little things that other guys don't pick up on. And, and you said, Rhett, them. going, you, you said that the room missed that. As soon as Daryl in the, the first carnation, when he went upstairs to just be the GM, when he was out of the room, that was a big aspect of what your, what made your team click that was just gone. Yeah. And I, I think part of that had to do that we'd had success. He was such a big personality but we had the 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 players and the personalities to deal with Daryl's personality. Do you know what I mean? Like we talked about it a couple of weeks ago. Who's telling Daryl to maybe tone it down a little times on this team? I don't know. I said well, Luch or Lewis, maybe fully. But but the group that we had back in the day, we, they laughed. They understood. They knew the buttons he was going to push. They knew the intensity, but they weren't intimidated by it. They, they could handle it, live it, and, and carry on about their business. Daryl came with, with lots of people. It's like, they can't take it. It's, it's too much. So when his personality left the room, it was, it, it was missed. But, and then I also said the other problem was that Jimmy Playfair, who came in, I think originally he would be, well, he is. He's a Daryl clone. But because Daryl left, Jimmy didn't want to be like Daryl because Daryl was supposedly leaving because he was too hard on guys. So now Jimmy's trying not to be the guy he is and blah, blah, blah. It all gets screws up. And we got rid of Conroy, let him go to L.A. It was a terrible move. We can't, can't be doing can't, that. You can't do it. Stupid. Well, we changed but, so much of the team. I mean, that's the one thing. When Daryl's down there, he's emotional. He's mad. He, he goes after guys. As a GM, he traded people. <laughs> you know, then you can't <laughs> yeah, get them yeah. back. You know, it's like 
I don't know what he gave up for Chris Clark. I'm always trying to figure out what did he give up for Chris Clark? Why would Chris Clark not be on the team again? Like, uh, you know, there were certain things as a GM, why would he trade Dion for what he, what, yeah. what the heck? Like in my mind that day, I thought that was a joke when I was down in the locker room, they said, Dion just got traded. And I thought, what? Why would you trade Dion? Like, yeah. okay, we're getting first round picks. We're getting, you know, and the guys that came back, it was just quantity, you mm -hmm. know, and you gave up quality and you get, get quantity and great guys. I mean, Jamal Mears and I were roommates in St. Louis. I mean, no problem with the, but just the things he did, the, the moves he made as a GM, as a coach, he's emotional. He doesn't like you that day, but the next day it's okay. But when he's up above, he was able to just get rid of you. You can't untrade a guy. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like all of a sudden he's yeah. like, well, maybe I should have kept him. No, uh, it's too late. You know, he's gone, yeah. but well, we Tra wondered trading's not the same as bench. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Benching is different. Like the, that then and hands on and him to be able to talk to the team and, and that personality in the room works really well. That personality probably in the office, I can't imagine it being upstairs and you know, and I, I never was with Daryl upstairs, yeah. but I can't imagine that would be because people don't expect what he probably brings up there. You know, because I asked Mike Burke, was he similar to the way he is down? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's the way he yeah, was. So, yeah. you know, I'm thinking, hmm, I wonder how that works, you know. But it's just a different dynamics. But that's where I always thought he gets the most out of the players as a coach. That's why he went right back and had success because he pushes and he, like, squeezes you every day to try to get a little bit more, a little bit more, which is which is hard. And and like Rhett said, I think we most of our coaches were like that. I had Jacques Demare, really nice guy and won a Stanley cup. And he, he was the exception. I think that he was a player's coach for me, everyone else, you know, Mike was the GM and coach uh, Mike Keenan of St. Louis. And he was very hard and, you know, similar to Daryl and, you know, Joel Quinville um, is different than Daryl, but a lot of the same coaching styles, but maybe in the locker room, his personality is different, you know, but they were always hard. I mean, there was not easy, you know, Mark Crawford, he could yeah. lose it with them. I mean, you see sure, him on the yeah. bench, you know? So I think we grew up with that and we, I shouldn't say expect it, but that's kind of what we expected, you know? And we would just, mm -hmm. we, we would go have some beers and laugh it off. And oh, did you hear what he said to me? Yeah. Did you hear <laughs> what he said? Yeah. And we thought it was funny, but I don't know. Not everyone's wired that yeah, way. Yeah, it, it, it's different. You know, guys are, are are more sensitive and they feel, you know, it's personal. And that's one thing I try to explain. It's not personal. I mean, he could say something very, you might take as personal the night before, where I would be like, wow, he crushed me. When I got home, I'd tell my wife, I'm like, whoa, you should hear what Daryl said. <laughs> but the next day I went day, home I and him. cried once. <laughs> and then the next day you walk in and nothing. He's not, you're like, oh, you're kind of the, you're a little going by him. What's he going to, yeah, of course you know, that wasn't very nice last night, but, and then you're like, he didn't say anything. Like he, he said, good morning. I'm like, Ooh, that's, that's weird. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's like he forgot he said it. And <laughs> then I just was like, Oh, okay. And once you kind of get that through, that's, that's kind of how it works. I mean, so it's just a different type of coaching style. It's uh, <laughs> but that's, what's given him success, yeah. you know, yeah. but if you also have so, to have the right, room because the guys have to be supportive of each other and have their each other's backs right like that's that's part of it yeah he wants to bring you know he wants it's almost like bring everybody together uh, not against him but kind of like in a way right in a way yeah mm -hmm. you know like we're gonna bring these guys together and uh you know and i'm gonna be hard i mean and that's where the assistant coaches are so key i mean they have to be we had a uh, rich preston was in there remember when he used to come in before the games with the toe blake and do the fist pump yeah. and tell jokes on yeah. the bus. I mean, you have to have some, something like that to keep it light. You know, obviously I, I haven't been down and see who that guy is, yeah, but yeah. I mean, Kirk Muller's played in the league, won Stanley cups, uh, you know, he was with Ken Hitchcock. So I'm assuming, yeah. you know, he, he can handle all that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, he's always a little bit hard on the goalie coach. <laughs> so La Barbara probably, <laughs> you know, it's just, He's hard on goalies and goalie coaches and he expects a lot. And they're goalies, in backups, goalie coaches. Yeah. I seem to remember there was a goalie coach nearly took a puck in practice. That's kind of a legendary story, isn't it? I didn't see that. Mm. I seem to remember something about <laughs> it. It is a you know, puck nearly hit a hit somebody anyway. Like we've been in a studio for how long talking with Connie here, and it's like 
there's we haven't talked about a player. We haven't talked about like the run of play. And I think I just keep coming back to is the identity of this team not Daryl Sutter? I mean, you could talk about captains and who wears letters and all that, but if you really want to know how this team plays and what their identity is going to be if they're successful, you say the coach's name. Like he's that big of a I guess personality or philosophy. Would you agree with that, Connie? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it starts with the, you know, the coach has a, what, how he wants this team to play and what he expects. And, and then the players have to kind of fall into line, you know, and that's, uh, you know, and I thought Bob Hartley was very similar. Bob did a great job, maybe with, with less talent or younger players. You know, I thought Bob was one of those guys that every day he wanted to grind out a little bit more, you know, and that's, I mean, it's hard because everybody wants the nice coach, but as soon as he's too nice and we lose, oh, it's, he's just too nice. And yeah, then they know. want the hard coach and then yeah. they want the nice coach. And, you know, there's really no perfect, you know, you try to think coaches out there that, you know, and, and we're always watching and seeing what coaches, who's having success, who's doing well, who's, what, how do they coach? I listen to all, I mean, like, I listen to all the interviews and I think Rod Brindamore, I would like to play for this guy. You know, there's certain yeah. guys you listen to as coaches. I, I like that. I like what he's saying. Sure. I think that's fair, unfair. He's hard, but fair. And, you know, there's certain guys and he's one that I always thought, I really like the way, you know, his, his thing. And just watching him on the bench, he's, he's firm, but, you know, so he always also can give a little pat in the back. Good job. Feels like he protects those guys. Yeah, it feels like he yeah. does, you know, and I think, that, that, that says, that means a lot because when you're a player, you know, Rhett, when you get ripped in the locker room, you get ripped everywhere. And then the media, you feel like if your guy can protect you a little bit, that's, that's it. He's got your back. Well, you want him you to know, have your back nice. for sure. Yeah. You want him to have exactly, your back sure. exactly. You know, you mentioned Buck Demers and sorry, yeah. we got, I'll get uh, Alex to back this one up. I actually saw, I, I forgot about, uh, so let's, yeah, got lots of let's get the volume on this one. We'll back it. Let's back, start it off uh, at the beginning again, and we'll get the volume on it. Is this a uh, memory lane with Craig Conroy here? This is my dream come true, Look playing for the Montreal Canadiens. Yes. Craig Conroy, 20 years old, less than a year out of Clarkson College, 25 goals and 17 assists at Fredericton, and a smile that just won't quit. Conroy, like Darby, will start between Vincent Domfus and Brian Bellows. And like Darby, he'll be expected to do the mucking. So I think if I just go in there and work hard and get, try to get them the puck, then things are going to happen. So I'm just going to go out and basically just try to work hard and get, get those guys a puck and let them do what they do best. He's a spark plug. He's got uh, a lot of spunk. He's intense. And we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Conroy is undaunted by the length of his tryout. If it's only three games, then it's still great to play in a, a Montreal Canadiens uniform. And I've, I, I, that could make my career. But hopefully it'll be longer and you know hopefully I can just come out here and you know play the way I'm supposed to and you know things will go well from there. And Matthew Schneider moves it up for the Canadians. Puck knocked across in front. Brashear gets it loose. Head stop, rebound, scores. Conroy. <laughs> <laughs> Craig Conroy was there to take advantage of us. The boomers what laughing at me. Was because first no, of all, the I Canadians just, found themselves in a nice like, two-on-one situation. Look there with Donald Brashear. You see the red is not only out and of the net, and but Lyle Odelon. The There's some meat out there. I don't know if you're on a line goons. change or what, but that's something. So look at that. That was number one right there. Yep, number one. That that's was, awesome, right? Yeah, you know what? I mean, Montreal was my team growing up. That, that was my dream come true. Yeah. And like I said, I didn't think. If I played a handful of games, I had no clue. I mean, Potsdam, New York, you know, no one's played in the NHL. So for me to be able to play for my team, the Montreal Canadiens, to score a goal, if that was it, then I was going to be happy. You know, thank God it went a little longer than that and more things happened. But, <laughs> it did, you yeah. know, that was, the, that was the goal. And it is did funny to hear it? because – sorry, I was just, just going to say for, to hear you at that point – because you don't know if there's a career. This could be one game and you're gone. Yeah. I, you want to enjoy every minute of it, but to hear you ah, kind of I hope BS. I'm sticking around. Oh, shucks, I'll give it my best and hopefully the coach I likes me. Well, I don't know. I, I, I'm betting Connie had a plan to play more than three games. Well, the plan was to play more than three, but you just didn't, you know, you didn't know. I mean, in the minors, you're, you're a six-round draft pick. I'm not a high draft pick like Rat. 
you know, a, uh-huh. a blue chip prospect, yeah. you're kind of <laughs> look at the face. Yes. You're kind of thinking, Oh, okay, here we go. I mean, you're, you're not r- wrong. And, and Montreal was, just won yeah. the cup. I mean, Montreal yeah. just won the cup. So you're going to a very oh, yeah. good team. You know, that that's the, you know, for me, it was fortunate to kind of be there with the new building coming in. I was there the night Patrick Waugh, I think it was minus four the night Patrick Waugh got yeah. Minus four outside, temperature wise, yeah, or minus four so where do you remember yeah, the weather, right. Connie? Yeah. That's odd. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think two bad changes by Vinny Damfus, and I jumped on. I didn't get two feet. Iserman goal breakaway, Fedorov breakaway. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. So yeah. did the Avalanche I think send the other you a two ring? Are my fault. The other two are my fault. <laughs> they should have sent me a ring. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think Peter Hanlon might have went and looked and said, "Yeah, I think you were minus four." Correct? That was yeah, ninety five, sure ninety. That was ninety five, ninety six. Ninety four, ninety five. I think ninety four, ninety five. Yeah, right in there. Or ninety three, ninety four. Yeah. Ninety four, ninety five. I think. Ninety four, ninety five. Six games, one goal. Yeah, it was only one goal. Yeah, I only played thirteen games for Montreal. So was that the traded. T- tail end of the year or you got moved right away? Okay. Yeah, it said training camp. My bad. 6 94 95, the following year 95 96, seven games, and then off to St. Louis. Yeah. So, yeah, it was one of those where the best thing that ever happened to me was just to be moved. I mean, I think Darcy Tucker, there was, you know, there was guys that Saku Quavo just got in and there just wasn't going to be room for me in Montreal. So to be able to get moved with Pierre, you know, and I thought when I got traded, I thought I was going to go to Worcester. I was in Fredericton, so I said, oh, I'm going to go to Worcester. And they said, no, you're actually going, you're going to meet the team in Colorado and play. And I, I buried one against Patrick that night. Yes. So you mentioned Pierre, that's Pierre Turgeon, yeah. French Canadian guy leaving Montreal, going to St. Louis. How was that received by Habs fans? It's kind of one of their own leaving town. It's, it's weird because when you're in Fred, you know, being in Fredericton, I was just so excited to be part of a trade and to maybe get an opportunity. I don't even know what was going on in Montreal. I yeah. mean, I think they were upset. You know, you lose a French Canadian. I mean, it is very important there. That's what people, you know, unless you've been there and lived it and seen it, how much that meant. But that's why even getting rid of Patrick, I mean, Patrick said, he took his helmet that night yeah, and said, yeah. I'm going to, this is it guys, you know, my last game. And I thought, I wonder if he's serious or, I mean, I wasn't saying much. I was just sitting there thinking, this is crazy. Like this is, I've never seen quite like this, but, and he was gone. That's one of the more iconic moments in obviously Habs history, but almost when you think hockey wow. history, one of the greatest it goaltenders changed, because, ever. Yeah. It, Cause it changes the course of history for hockey. Sure. It yeah. does. You got that dynasty Very in Colorado right. now. Yeah. Yeah. They're they go and win the games and... without him. <laughs> no way. Yeah. It was Florida. Uh, we would have won. Our... That's right. Sure. See, it all comes back yeah. to ret. Well, Inevitably, I mean, it comes back to retro. That's good. I like it. Somehow Patrick Wall right. went from the east to the west and it hurt Florida. I missed that somehow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you know. You know what? Uh, I want to get this in. We're going to mention it a couple of times. Sorry, right? I just, uh, we have Craig here in studio in the, uh, in our studios here, the Barnburner Studios. Coming up on November 28th, it is, uh, what, the fifth annual now, right? Let's talk hockey with yourself and Rob oh, This Kerr. thing's been going about 20 years now. Curse. I've been doing it, I think, for 10 is that right? This is the first time in three years, though, we're going to be back live doing it in per- person. Awesome. Yeah, so yeah. that's exciting for us. Let's talk hockey in support of the Prep Society, therapeutic and educational support to children with Down syndrome. 6 30, 9 30 p.m. at the Dome. Tickets are available. You see the website there, prepprogram.ca. The link is, uh, is there. Noah Hanifam, Nazem Kadri, Chris Tanev. How did you get these big names? <laughs> you know what? They're just good guys. Is that what it is? I think yeah. once once you mention the kids Down syndrome, yeah, they're not saying no. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I hate to say it, like you'd love to say I had to work, and you know they just said, "Oh, absolutely, I would love to do it and be a part of it." Yeah, and, you so, know, especially with Kadri coming in new, and yeah. boy, when I asked him, you know, he's still playing great, but boy, he was off to a great start. He's the one guy, Rhett, I think. His personality and 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 Daryl seamless. You know, I think that yeah. because they're kind of similar. Yeah. Like they they go about their business, and I think he's had a great start. A lot of it because of that. Because he can. Okay, no problem. I th- I forget which game it was. I think it was two maybe two games ago, and he was yipping someone hard. Like I wonder what player he's really given it to. It was the ref. Oh really? <laughs> he was laying. You M- M- F- and the ref and everything. Wake the 
stopped. Like he was yeah. really giving it to him. I wish we would lay off the refs a tad. <laughs> it doesn't seem to help, Connie. No, it's weird, it really. Right? Like you know, even when I played here, we are Daryl's not easy on the ref. As players, we aren't easy. We were not. Remember, ref? I mean, everyone's the poor ref goes by. We're all screaming at him. And then we're like, why aren't we getting any calls? I can't figure this. You know, I, I think it might be Luch is yelling at him. If I didn't see Kadri yelling at him, but I do think, God, I wish we would maybe just lay off the refs a little but bit. But he is back to the original point there. <laughs> Because I know it was out of all the new faces and all that, who do you think is going to have the biggest impact? And you, you maybe you default to, to Huberto, but it was something about Kadri and the way, like you say, it just felt like he's not going to have any issue coming in and fitting in like a, a dirty shirt, and he sure did. Yeah, I mean, I think the swagger he came with winning the cup, the way he's played, he's been on different teams. Yeah. You know, I think with Huberto, he's only been in one place. Yeah. And the one place he could have 10 goals, or be minus 10 and when he walks out the rink guess what it's the same it's just a guy here yeah. <laughs> you know and i always say if you're going to play in a canadian market this is the market to be because everyone wants you to do well here you're going to get a long long leash but people still care and they're going to talk about it and you're not going to be able to hide anywhere in the city i mean that's just the way it is which i like i mean why would you want to play somewhere where they don't talk about your care it's passionate they want you to and they but they want you to do well here and I think, I did think Huberdo, it's going to be a little hard for him because expectations, you want him to do what the guy up north's doing, those two guys, probably every night. Yeah. And, and that's hard. And there's chemistry. And when we brought Bo Meester in from Florida, mm -hmm. it didn't gel. It didn't gel right away. So it takes a while to get that chemistry. And I think that's kind of what happened. But with, with Kadri, he just comes in with a swagger. You're like, whoa, this guy's really, you know, he's ready to go. Yeah, He's not feeling any pressure he's he's just going to go about his business and let's be honest he played in toronto he's seen that market yeah he probably thinks this market's nothing cakewalk for toronto yeah this is this is easy you know and, he, and he's colorado so you know i think just give it a little time for the guys and and everybody else settle in and, and it's right where it's early and i think the division is obviously a, a little easier not i don't want to say easier but one team kind of is running away right now in yeah. vegas and, and then everyone else is so right around there and seattle's played well to start yeah. and i'm guessing he's not i mean go over the list of coaches that he's had in florida i'm guessing there's quite a few probably not many cut from that sutter cloth yeah i mean the only one i had would be joel and joel's different joel's a, a, a different a, off but yeah. on the bench he's in i mean joel's got this a lot of the th similarities the way they run practices the way they expect you to play what they want you to do you know, there's, it's non-negotiable. Certain things are non-negotiable and that's how Joel was. But I think Joel's, he could take the foot off the gas in the room, in the, you know, at different times, like Joel likes yeah. uh, horse racing and he loves football and he'll go to on Sundays. He's always going to the, the Cardinals games, you know, the Rams games when they were there, you know, so he had a lot of hobbies and, and that's the difference. You know, that's what I would say, but it's just similar coaching style. So, you note the new guys, we talked a bit about Kadri, expectations for Huberto, Uyghur is another guy that comes in. What's a, you talked about the off the ice adjustment. What about an on ice adjustment? You talked about Huberto is coming from a pretty different system, albeit some similarities between the coaches. Like when Daryl came in, how different was your job or as maybe a 200 foot checking center, was it not that different? Like, what are you expecting in terms of when these guys you think will be their best selves under Daryl. Are we there yet already? Like Kadri, obviously a great start, but the other two you're saying, okay, like still adjusting, it looks like. Well, I don't think it's the coaching. I don't think it's a system. I mean, that's, if I had to go with Joel and what Daryl want, I'm saying we're pretty close. Like it's, okay. it, it would not be the systems. What it would be is the chemistry with the players. You know, it's weird because coming here, I, did I ever thought I'd, I'd get to play with Jerome McGinley? No. Did we think we'd have any kind of kept? Not really. Mm. It it kind of by default, when Savvy got hurt yeah. in Detroit, I got to play with him and he went on a tear. And then all of a sudden you have that chemistry. You know, I never would have thought there was chemistry. And I think just to, to figure out the chemistry to get that going, that might take some time. You, you know, like I mentioned Bo Meester. I mean, we I thought we had maybe the best D in the league with Fanuf, Regeer, you know, all the guys. And in the end, it just, we couldn't get that figure. I mean, we still made the playoffs, but it didn't work quite the way as a player I thought it was going to work. 
and it just took, it just took some time to kind of figure it out. You know, even when we had Dougie here and then we finally put him with Gio, mm-hmm. I thought that really, really took off then, you know, Brody and Gio and Brody playing his offside. Brody just likes playing the right side better than the left. Yeah. Those are all the things, you know, is Uyghur better on the right or, I mean, those are all things Daryl's trying to figure out right now. And you'd love for it to be like Kadri and he's seamless. He, he can play with anybody and he's going to have success, but that's just not always the case. And I don't think it's so much the system as just the chemistry with the players. Sure. And yeah. isn't that one of the things too, with the game now, it feels like you're a bit, like you say, it's early or give it time or be patient. There's none of that. Almost none of that anymore. Where a five game losing streak feels like 20 and a seven feels like 30. Just it, every two, three days, if something is continuing, it's so great or it's so awful, right? <laughs> it's, so- it's true. And we compare to other people. It's like Pinder said, Matthew had three. Yeah, I knew he had three assists less. I, I mean, I, I find myself watching the yeah. guys that have left, you know, and not be overly excited with them doing really well. Like, oh, you know, and it's, it's I think that's just human nature. We, and by we, I mean Rhett, mm. we were maybe a little critical of the line combinations that we've seen that Daryl has gone to. It's uh, we like the first seven games. The fir- yeah, it was, it was really <laughs> good. And then sense. there were some, yeah. some changes in that. Again, I'm not looking for you to get into any trouble or anything like that. But Rhett, would you say it's fair to say that it's kind of uncharacteristic of Daryl to have swapped out the lines to that degree this many times this early? It was like three different major iterations you've had, right? Yeah, I just thought the first time was the biggest one because – once you make that switch, it's you've made it. That's kind of, you know, the coaches, they always have that opportunity to make changes on the lines and you can do it as often as you want, I guess. But the team wasn't really struggling. Huberto, they were, you know, the talk was, well, maybe he's not putting up as many points as everyone would like, but it wasn't, it wasn't impacting wins and losses. And all of a sudden, you know, you kind of, you lose that one to Edmonton and all of a sudden he changes the lines. And I was like, Whoa, like it seemed a little drastic to me. And then, and then it doesn't work out the other way. So now you got to go back and now you're mixing and mingling and guys come out, they go in. It's, it just seemed at that point to be a little, a little, well, I said it already a little bit drastic. And my concern, if we want to dig deeper into it is, is he trying to push too many buttons? I mean, a lot of the conversation we're having is about Daryl. You've got to work with him, so maybe you shouldn't say anything. But that was my <laughs> take. My take you know was, don't, I hope he's not back to a spot because he can do that where he tries to to maybe do too much. You know, I mean, it's it wouldn't even be fair for me to say because – you were in Buffalo. I've been, yeah. I've been gone also. Unless you're down in the room with the coaching staff, I don't know what the conversations were in the line changes, what they're seeing in practice, and you know. So it'd be it. It would really be unfair for me. I think he's just trying to figure out what the best combination. Would he love to just like last year? It just felt like yeah. all those combinations worked, and we just rolled with them yeah. the whole year, you know. And that's I've played on teams like that where. He, you know, in St. Louis, we had really good teams and I, I just played with the same two guys. The whole, the lines never changed. They just were the same. And then we, you know, the next year we had some guys that left, some guys that came back, expansion, blah, blah, blah. And then it felt like I played with a lot of guys. You know, it didn't, it did never, didn't settle down maybe for a, you know, a, a month. So we're a little bit more than a month now, but yeah, I wish I was in the meetings and could hear what Daryl's thought process was, but you know, I, I wasn't. So, you know, you just have to go with, he's the coach. He knows what he's doing. <laughs> yeah. There's a long game too here. And, and yeah. if, if something, if you have to put someone somewhere that gets them going later, I'm sure that's the thing. One of the, I guess, silver linings is Adam Rzichka looks like a really contributing part of the top six. Never mind the bottom six. He couldn't even get into for the bulk <laughs> of the first 10 games. Walk us through Rosie's development. And maybe, you know, even from the draft year, it was always consistency was the one thing, but is something different now or is this just a nice run, I guess, is the question we're asking. It's about opportunity. It's about getting to play. I mean, what is he going to do when he doesn't play? I mean, you said it yourself, like he couldn't even get in the bottom six. Now he's getting in getting on the ice with good players. He's a big guy, can skate, has skill, you know, 
as for a young guy, yeah, his consistency has is, is always been an issue for us. But when he's in the American League, he dominates. You know, first line center, uh, him and Matty Phillips and Pelche, they were, you know, anybody he kind of played with, they were unbelievable. He was one of the top scorers whenever he's down there. So you knew he had that in him. It's just he got the opportunity and he's taken advantage. It's fun for us. You know what? Yeah. Because we're excited to see, you know, instead of having to say, oh, we got to go out and find another forward, a top six forward. Well, it's nice when you can bring Internally, one along. Yeah. So hopefully, I mean, and it's 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 a few games, but you, you can see he's got a lot of confidence now. He's feeling good about himself. I, th- I said it the other day. I thought his the last game yep. was easily his best game as a pro. And it wasn't just that he scored or that he's got four points in four games, but he was making plays. Whereas before it may just be get somebody take this puck because I don't want to turn it over and get benched and then sit upstairs again. Where he was making some plays that showed that that creativity, that that hockey sense was there. And now he's got maybe some confidence to make those plays. I well, thought he was really good the other night. And he turned over a couple pucks. I don't. I mean, in, in the first game, he turned over two pucks on any other given night, he would not have gone out again, but he did go out. So yeah. he knew, Oh, I, I'm not going to get benched here. I'm going to play. I mean, that was the one thing when you're on those top six, Yeah, you know, we made mistakes. Daryl address them on the bench and, but you still got to go back out and try to make up for those mistakes. And, and that's what you, because if you're playing where you feel like if I make one mistake, I'm not playing the rest of the game, you know, Rhett would tell you, you can't play like that. You just, you got to be able to, you got to be able to play and you're, it's a game of mistakes. You want to limit them, but it, there are going to be mistakes, but for his size, skating skill and his shot, I don't know how often you see him shoot because he doesn't shoot it, but in practice, he's got one of the best shots in the team. I mean, it's hard, accurate, and uh, he's just a big guy. Yeah. So it, it, it's fun for us to see him do well. I mean, I, I mean, I'm rooting for him. He's worked hard. He deserves it. And hopefully uh, knock on wood, it continues. Chatting with Craig Conroy. We're going to say it's in, place of the pinder report today sure absolutely. Uh, yeah. you know why not uh, pinder report brought to you by village honda common experience the all new redesigned 2023 honda crv at village honda your dealership for life in the northwest auto mall i wondered about you this uh this past off season because i think it was a, it was difficult for a lot of flames fans to see johnny goodrow leave town but you and johnny you guys were kind of together right at the very beginning the draft the whole thing that was well, wow, the paperwork that was big too. The right? private jet to bring yeah. him in. Right? He was he would not have been a flame were it not for Craig Conroy and that mm-hmm. smile that we heard from Demers. That, that, that smile. Yeah, shucks, I'll give it my best. Just won't <laughs> quit there. It there is that personal side, and I think that it. What was it like for you to know that it was over? Yeah, that hurt. It, it, I'll be honest. You know, because you know, like Bob Hartley says, Connie, you f- fall in love with the players, and I do. You know, and I fell in love with Johnny right away, and. You know, we had a connection and, and to have them, you know, and even when I came on your show, I was, you know, when we said, are you going to get it done? And I said, yeah, we're going to get it done. I always believed we were going to get it done. Just like I believed I had moments when we went to sign them the first time that maybe it wasn't going to happen. I was freaking out a little bit then too, but in the end we got it done. I, I really thought it was going to happen. I thought the legacy, the city, you know, I think his parents love it here. I mean, Guy, I was with Guy at the hotel and uh, we were at a different hotel in Dallas. And yeah, I just felt like it was meant to be. And I mean, I talked about retiring jerseys and all time yeah. leading flames point leader over. And I go, you're not going to catch Jerome's goals, but <laughs> <laughs> you're going to catch him in points. And, you know, for me, I thought all that, and, and we have a good relationship. He might not want to sit hurt my feelings or whatever. And, you know, so yeah, it was, it was, it was tough, you know, and, and I know some people say, well, we're better. We're, you know, for me, it was a personal thing and we, and we were, we were friends and I thought he was, he's a special player. And he is a special player. I mean, the same with Matthew. I hate to see Matthew leave. I would have loved to have both of them back, you know, and add a few pieces around them. That would have been, you know, kind of our plan going into the draft. And then when Johnny didn't come back, and Matthew told us he wasn't going to come back. You know, it, it for me personally, it takes a low. I take it personal because I'm like, what? You know, I'm like, we treat you. I felt like I uh, anything they needed. You know, yeah. You care about the guys, and then, uh, but I get it. I I do get it. It's just hard. Do you remember the first time you watched him? Because I remember the day he was drafted. We were at the dome. 
And then we got him on the air and he had a, a pretty thick accent at that time. <laughs> he, his buddy had played in Sam and Am, like that was all he kind of knew about Western <laughs> Canada, that sort of thing. And it was like, how big is this guy? Not. This guy, is, what are they? What, no, are no. they what do you remember from that first, where was it? At what Was he still ushl or what do you remember uh, you would have been was, special advisor to feaster at yeah, that point so i just came on board so i got to watch my video i didn't even get to see him play live yeah i listened to the scouts see what they said obviously lewis my agent had him uh. said he's special i'm like oh this is you know you watch him i'm like what is this guy doing like he's unbelievable so you could you could see you know read the reports see what people are saying and then when we finally draft him when he came in for that first little development camp, we were playing a three on three game. And I remember saying it was Lance Boma. It was like three NA, three American league guys at the time. Booms wasn't a regular in the NHL, but I said, okay. I said, I get that he's small, but you need to hit him. Like you need to finish him and you need to be hard on this guy. I know you probably land, he goes, no, we can't hit him. I'm like, what? I'm like, no. Cause I literally walked down from the top to say, okay, enough. Put a like, body on this it's guy. It's embarrassing yeah. right yeah. now, this guy. And they're like, we can't do anything. And I'm like, really? I'm like, you're trying? I'm yeah. like, okay. You know, so I mean, to watch him in practice, he made a backhand sauce, spinorama, backhand sauce over three sticks for a guy on a breakaway. And I thought, that's not easy. You know, I don't know if anybody in the NHL on our NHL team could do that. That's like tangy stuff, like those kind of passes. I'm like, oh. So then to go see him play at Boston College, I remember the first games, I think he was playing against North Dakota and, uh, we had a Pierre Lamaru was working for us, but he also was going to school in North Dakota and he was doing part-time stuff for their, you know, their team. And he kind of said, Hey, we're going to have to watch Gaudreau because he's a special player. And then like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good job. Like you're, you're just a, you know, yeah. you're a student, you're helping. You're, we don't need any advice on John. We don't, not worried about him. He dominated the first game. The next day, they're like circled his number. We have to try to figure out how to stop this guy. Yes. <laughs> 160 pounders ruining everything. But I would be begging to take him to the World Juniors. We were in Lake Placid. I'm like, guys, you know, like, well, we can't invite him to the camp. He's not. I'm like, really? You can't invite him to the. I'm like, if you get him here in the summer, special he's special to learn a spot you know and then yeah. the next year obviously they brought him and he led the tournament goals they win gold and i'm thinking you know he so john's had to fight his way every step of the way you know nobody was just handed it to him you know obviously when we got him and brought him back and he scored in his first game those are exciting things and that's why i mean it, with that our the, our relationship you know maybe it was more hoping that he would come back uh you know rather than just me being for sure. It did feel like he was in knots and it did feel like this definitely swung in the balance. This wasn't like, haha, I'll keep it as late as I can and screw the team. That's, that's not any of the vibes. Anyone close to it is, is relayed to me. And then I think like one more angle to bring in is when that happens. And then Matthew comes with the news to, uh, to Brad and you guys saying, you know what, I'm not going to extend. So you, everyone starts saying, well, Americans will never sign here. Stop trafficking Americans. It's Fox. And now these guys, and there's Connie, an American boy, who has like made his home here, like loves the flames, came back, works for the team. Like you got to be like, no, this is not right. You can't, this is not true. And it's a bad set of coincidences. Uh, you know what? I think it is, you know, and I, I want to ask those guys, neither of the guys played anywhere else. I want to see in five years what they say. Yeah. It, honestly, like, because I know everybody thinks it's better other places, but until you get there, you don't know. You don't know what it's like. You don't know how well a guy like Peter Hanlon, Kelso, the staff, you know, just the way they're treated in the city. I mean, I think that's the one thing people don't understand is, you know, people say, oh, well, there's a lot of, yeah, there's pressure, but you know, you're also treated extremely well where I don't see Matthew at South Beach getting any perks, you know, where he could do, he could call at any moment at any restaurant and find a table for him. They're going to, if he wants to go to a con anything he wants to do, and maybe, maybe they do, you know, and that's what I said. I'd love to find, talk to Matthew. You know, I still text Matthew, uh, you know, and I would love to see what he says in five years, you know, if, and maybe it's way better. And I, I just don't know. I mean, Rhett, Rhett played in Florida and he played in Calgary. Uh, you know, he'd be the best one to, what do you think, Rhett? Wow. Well, it's, <clears throat> There's lots of differences. I think the thing is, 
it's what you said about uh, Huberto. You get 10 points or you lose 10 nothing. You walk out, it's the same thing, right? Like, there's no – you don't have – I loved having pressure and having the community behind you. And not that the Florida fans don't cheer for the Panthers, but it's certainly not even close to the passion that a Calgary Flames fan has. So I liked that part of it. I remember coming from my house on Madison. I'd come over by the cemetery there over the hill, and I'd say – I would say in my head, I want to do good by the city on in my truck on the way into games. I, and that's, and I honestly would. Uh, I like that part of it. And I think most players like to have fans and, and people that maybe aren't as passionate as Daryl, perhaps, but still passionate and excited about the game of hockey, right? And have an opinion on it. So I think that the places those guys went won't offer that as much. And I, I think I I always found it harder to play in those places. You don't. You don't College have, football is uh, way bigger than the Blue Jackets. Yeah. It's not close. Like in Miami, you're the fourth, fifth, or sixth most important team. Sorry, like, and and that for some guys that's great, Connie. Right? You want yeah. an anonymity? Have at her. Some guys don't like pressure. They don't want to play with pressure. Like it's weird to me because you're playing a sport. A little pressure is probably good, and that's where, you know. F- being American, coming back, LA. You know what though? I, I, not that I can say any place I played, <laughs> the fans were unbelievable. St. Louis, LA. As much as they say, well, LA is not. No, it, it really was full all the time. But yeah. I watched the game last night, and, and I'm looking at the stands, and there's a lot of empty seats in Florida last night. You know, and I'm thinking Matthew thrives on yeah the crowd, people. You know, I mean, we're still booing Dowdy the other night. I think because of Matthew. <laughs> That's right. Of course, yeah. I mean, I'm thinking, oh, Matthew's gone, and Dowdy's probably like, seriously, these guys still, still? hate me. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I, I think personally, I love it. Yeah, I love when you wake up in the morning and we lost, and maybe I played bad. You guys call me out, or you know, that's I'm going to do better next game. You know, I people, but people care, and people are like, oh, we're behind you. And for the majority of Calgary, like I don't remember ever going out and having people. Tr- ripping me or, you know, they were like, Hey, we want the, you got to get going. The teams we're, we're behind you a hundred percent. And, and that's the way it, that's the way it's always been in Calgary. That's why I say, if you can play for any Canadian city, uh, I'd want to play in Calgary. It sounds like a Calgary statement that we'd something the Calgarians would say, but I do feel like it is different where yeah. people are passionate, want you to win. They go to the games. They love it. But if they see you at the mall or at the movie, they're not going to oh, get your <laughs> shit together. You know, I, I just think that it's a little bit different here, which, and I've heard that from some of the players. I mean, you're yeah. one of them, right? That you can you can be in a town where they care. And like you say, Red, winning matters and the city is passionate for it, but they're not going to make your life miserable if the team's losing hockey games. The only time I had it happen to me was the O'Reilly thing when I was in management. Oh, that's and right. And literally, like a guy was driving down in a truck. He rolled out his window. What are you and Feast are doing? Are you guys idiots? I'm like, <laughs> I wanted to be like, now that it's this late, I'm like, the way I found out, you can ask Chris Snow if he's ever on. I literally said, someone put an offer sheet in an O'Reilly. Oh, that's us. <laughs> and then I, I clicked on the email and said, Snowy. <laughs> We put an offer sheet in on O'Reilly. And then we went to the game. And I remember Eric Lacroix was there. Bennington, I mean, they were just staring us down. I'm like, oh, oh this is weird. <laughs> you know, like we, we threw the offer sheet. We're at the game. And they matched that night. So it was done. But, yeah, I actually didn't even know. And I'm thinking, I'm getting chirped. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Walking down the street. And I actually didn't know either. <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah. was that a rock bottom moment for the organization in some ways or not? Because I know that the, the PA had interpreted it one way, but by the letter of the law, he would have come through re-entry waivers. If you had not matched, if the Colorado had not matched, you wouldn't even have got the player if someone claimed him, as weird as that sounds. Yeah, so we called, I guess, like, so I really wasn't, I wasn't privy to what was going on. Jay talked to, to Murray Edwards and they called the lawyers, the league, and they, I, pretty sure they went through this whole process to see what the rules were. Yeah. And I think, I don't know how it worked because there was a lockout. What He was in the K and there yeah, was re-entry yeah. waivers. What that was, was weird, right? But they were saying like, because of the lockout, it was, yeah. it was, it was, a, it was a weird thing. And they said, like, I think we would have fought it till the day 
yeah. we would still be fighting it if, if that was the case. But yeah, to me, they, the leak kind of said, no, you can do it. And then I forget which reporter put it out there. And I'm thinking that is the rule yeah. normally. And Mike Burke would say, yep, that's the late, that's the normal rule. Yeah. So for people that don't know what we're talking about, they put the offer sheet in, he was, Ryan O'Reilly was playing in the K. Didn't have a contract with Colorado. Stalemate. Colorado did yeah. match it, but if they chose not to match it yeah. and the Flames were to get O'Reilly, before he could come over, he'd have to go through waivers, essentially. Re -entry waivers. Yes. And every other team would have a chance to pick him. Yeah. So you'd have to have you given, up given up four firsts four and firsts lost the player. And not gotten the player. Yeah. yeah. And it, you probably would have got some traction, I would think, by fighting it. But it was, in terms of that, you, when you say, rock bottom i feel like for that iteration of the team it was and it felt yeah, like because, berkey came in soon after and that was part of the like build back a little reputation maybe yeah. i'm crazy it was a steady stream of people in my world the media world being what's going on in calgary yeah, yeah. like eyebrows raise like what what is going on and there? so you're new as as assistant to the yeah. gym at this point it's like oh my gosh what's happening well and and the thing was it wasn't like we went you know we went you know like and we do this with everything i mean you go to the league lawyers and make sure this is a way we interpret it. Yeah. Are you guys seeing the same way? And 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 Mike Burke does an unbelievable job with that. I mean, we've never had another issue. So I can't imagine we didn't get the approval. Like, yeah, this is good to go. You know, because we wouldn't have, we just don't yeah. do it like that. That's just not, you know, even when Jay was there, that's how it worked. Yeah. When when we do it now, you know, I'm assuming when Daryl was there, uh, that Well, was, you're talking to the agent too, right? So the agent yeah. has to interpret this as well. Oh, it's his client. Yeah, yeah, everybody. It was the lockout year that hurt are those games going to be you know what is the rule yeah. And, yeah. and nobody could come up with it and you know now it all worked out great for you know not great for us but it definitely worked out where they matched it was over and we moved yeah there's no could have been yeah. worse clearly. things always work out in the end right for was, connie yeah. like you were well always work out for connie because you were saying <laughs> earlier about how uh you know savvy gets hurt and then whatever and then you come in maybe you'll get a chance to play with with again right and it Wow. Who knew if you and Aginla were going to mesh? Because yeah. there was a time where you guys weren't necessarily best of friends. I think you were in <laughs> St. Right? Louis, and boy, Jerome was just a young, just I'm a young butt. If only we had, I don't know, it was different hair. If we only had video, <laughs> yeah, to yeah. to recall, everything has video. Uh -oh. oh, there's this one. Okay, Look at this fellow with the nice chin. Hey, did Red do the top shelf uh, goal celebration on the plane? He hasn't told that story on oh. this one yet. Hang on, let's see what's okay, coming up. Let's see. Need the volume. Is going after Conroy. Uh oh. And there they go. You end up very good for Craig, so. <laughs> doing very well with Craig Conroy. He beat me up when I was in St. Louis, so I, maybe you take it easy on me now that we're buddies. <laughs> you know, now he's got a family. He's getting a little soft. <laughs> <laughs> let's hear from Red at the beginning here. Yeah, we missed the audio. Start this. So I don't know why he wants a rematch. is going after Conroy. So how did that one start? Do you remember? I mean, I think you probably so, remember how it ended. Yeah, uh, Savvy, <laughs> Savvy went up behind Chris Pronger and speared him like, oh, know, yeah. speared him. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, so I went over and kind of, Hey, whoa, 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 whoa. but then as i turned around i was just standing there and then jerome said what well, he said something on the way and i don't remember what he said <laughs> and i thought oh geez so i went to grab him and then it was full of, yeah he was oh, already man. ready you know he junior he knew how to i'm a college guy i don't know what i'm doing <laughs> and <laughs> you, you play with a bubble <laughs> you know when you play with tough players like i've always played with so many tough players. you had brassier in the first highlight yeah, I had Brashear, but I had in the minors, I had Chris Murray was on my line. I don't know if you remember Chris Murray from sure. Cam Loops. Yep. Very fought tough him. on my line. You fought him? Very tough, Rhett. He was very tough. And I had Brashear. I had Mary Robert, Serge Robert. I had, I mean, that's just, and you could only have three lines and an extra forward then. Yeah. And I had all those guys on one team. Wow. Yeah. So that we had that. Then I had Kelly Chase, Tony Twist, Rudy Pocek. Uh, Mike Peluso, oh, all wow. in St. Louis. Yeah. Was Jansen's there? No, Jansen's wasn't well, there was then. Hartford. So when those scrums emerge, you're never scrapping. No. <laughs> There's always another guy to do the business. Yeah, you know, that's what I said. And they made it look really easy. Like, <laughs> yeah, this is it's, it's when you start getting punched. It's not even fun. Like, so I thought, oh boy, I'm not very good at this. Well, and, and in fairness, you shouldn't be fighting any of those tough guys. You shouldn't be fighting again, Ginla. <laughs> Right, you should be Good fighting point. guys that would be more in your weight class, or maybe Savvy. even a little bit below. Mm -hmm. Although I think there was one time where maybe there was oh, 
Is that you, right? You fought someone more. Or who's finding this? Did I ever I don't know jump have, start his career or what? I sure hope we have video of that. I kept his career. Oh, look at this. Battle of Alberta, Craig. Let's hear it. Oh. Uh, that, I slipped. They said he threw me down. You can see that's a no. slip. You can see that's a slip. Yeah, bring, bring the volume. Let's, let's start it again with the volume because I love Mark Lee. Mark Lee is doing the play-by-play. -play. He's not doing you any favors. Because it was a good start for you there. You were yeah. just, you were hanging in with Sam Gagne is what we're doing, watching the, the Oilers uh, here. And listen to Mark yeah. Lee okay. describe the scrap here after you guys fall to the ice. Oh, my glasses. Has had his stick high up in the area of the puck, and now a, a fight, and it's Sam Gagne. Sam Gagne. Wow. Gagne. I mean, I just slipped. Throwing right with Conroy. And he brings the crowd to its feet. This is a, a hockey player who was demoted to the fourth line by Pat Quinn. And right off the draw, he takes on Craig Conroy and wins it by unanimous decision. Well, is that unanimous? Down. Get out of there. Take on. That's maybe my favorite part of the whole. Like, unanimous. <laughs> like, Get out of here. I, I literally, my left hand slipped and that was over. Well, you landed way more than he did. That's nonsense. Well, and so the, why so are we at center? Real he's quick, about 16 years old there. Is oh, that? Uh, well, you know what sure happened? He, he came to the thing and he said, hey, I need something here. I got to fight. And I said, yeah, that's no problem. I said, at this point, my this is my, I'm 39 years old. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, what do you want to do? He goes, kid. can we fight right off the draw? <laughs> and I thought, okay, nope. I mean, so it's not like you're mad or anything. Yeah, you're yeah. just kind of standing there. <laughs> and and then he goes and has a seven. I think he might have had a six or seven point game. Against LA. Yeah. Just right after that. And he's still in the, I'm watching him. I'm like, eh. yeah, he's still playing. And he was like, he was having a rough go up to that point. Uh, as he said, demoted to the fourth line. Yeah, by and Pat it Quinn. jump started him. So he, I probably should have got some money along the way there. The Avalanche, a little bit of the contracts. Donye. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not too late. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So he's in C. Where he's in Winnipeg. Right now, Winnipeg. Right? Now, yeah, that's right. Is he he the other night. Yeah, Williams? Winnipeg. Good man. Yeah. Still see Conroy just making careers. Yeah. Yeah. So that's at center ice, but it's clearly not the beginning of the period because the ice isn't clean. Like, no. is that right after a goal? Uh, or do you remember? Yeah, I can't remember. It, it was. It might have been right after a goal, actually, because okay. we went out there and he just said, "Hey, you know what? I saw him talk to someone else first, and yeah. someone said no. So he came. He goes, "Hey, I, I need something here. You, you know, I." He so goes, nice, "What do you want to do?" I said, "Okay, no problem. We'll just, you know, when the puck drops." Did you ever have any of those retro where it's a your older young kid is like, "Dude, you need to help me out here. I need to do something." <laughs> I had to do it with Chase, or more than I. Nobody came and asked me because I wasn't much of a a win for guys. So <laughs> go fight Warner. And, beat him up it wasn't really a, a so you would go to kelly chase and say hey i need we need to go nah, wow well, he mentioned chase is the only reason i brought up chase because yes it is yeah. when i was trying to come into the league chaser had been the year before uh skating with the blades in saskatoon which is where i was and so we were playing our last exhibition game and i ran him and he's like don't you take advantage of the fact that we're buddies and i'm like F I'll tune you up. Chaser. I'm trying to make the NHL. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to do two things, uh, and then we'll. Uh, I want to give one more, a little bit more love to uh, the Let's Talk Hockey event before we go. But the first thing is, it was on this date in 2003, Calgary Flames trade San Jose Sharks for Mika Kiprasov. What do you remember about? I think we, we've kind of heard Rhett. The first kind of like. Oh, that might be pretty good. What do you remember about that day? Do you remember because what was it? Did McLennan had a broken sternum and Turek was hurt or whatever yeah, the, the knee injury? Yeah, yeah whatever the series a situation good start was there. Too. Yeah. It's like man, bad luck. They had a good start. Turek actually looked kind of good that year. And yeah. I remember, and it was Peter Marr was on the radio, and he actually it was Mika Siprikov. He actually, <laughs> you know, it's like well, we don't know who this guy is. Third stringer, right? Right. Is who's this guy coming in? I had no clue. I said Mika Mika Kiprasov. I'm like who? The, he's the third string goalie for San Jose. I'm like, well, obviously Daryl know him. And Daryl actually called Jerome and I went into the office and he said, Hey, we got this Mika Kiprasov, obviously with the injuries, you know, I think he's going to be a really good goalie. Oh, okay, good. You know, he goes, we had him. And then, uh, yeah, you don't think much of it. He comes in, we need a goalie. And that first practice, I was like, Whoa, this, 
this guy's making some, you know, it's, pra- I'm like, it's practice. So yeah, he's trying really super hard and it's practice, but then you just, as the game started, I thought, Oh, this guy he's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We might be all right here. And it was, it was, was crazy. I was actually annoyed. Well, not annoyed, but somewhat disappointed that because uh, noodles had been playing and I was like, well, don't everyone love noodles, right? So yeah. you're kind of like, give him his shot that he brought in another goal. I'm like, oh, okay. But you didn't really. But he had the broken like, sternum, though. Yeah, Oof. he got that shot. I mean, he couldn't even yeah. hardly like put his hand down. Like noodles, I mean, I give noodles credit. Yeah. yeah. I and give what was the sin? Just, I guess, kind of quickly, right? Because you, you have told this story to me before, at least, when that the first instance during a game where you were thinking, oh, okay, something there. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what my – now, this is how my memory – I think it was the first game in one of the first shifts, and I think we were playing uh, Montreal, and it was a two-on-one on Redster. And uh, <laughs> the Redster didn't do a lot. He didn't take away the shot or the pass, so uh. it was a backdoor tap-in for somebody, and Kipper slid across and made the save, and I'm like, ooh, yeah. I like this. this we got some cool. here. I like this guy. <laughs> it's, yeah. It was those lateral yeah. ones where you're like, this guy's different. Like he could yeah. cover that back door like no one else. That's the way to fully scored the other game, like on quick, Kipper yeah. was getting those. Yeah. Like yeah. He yes. would come across yeah. and get that. You're yeah. like, Whoa. It's crazy. And Look he's at, so far out. If you're watching mask, on YouTube, geez. you'll see there because Kipper's got the white <laughs> mask on. So he that's got to be right. Whatever Within San Jose's first, affiliate is, that's the gear. The first week <laughs> or so after the deal, that's you. Hey, thanks for that. Uh, I didn't take the shot or the pass I'll take on one that. next time. Appreciate you, but I'll buy you, you a drink. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what he's saying. See you at Cowboys yeah. on Thursday. And a, you, you talk about pivotal moments, man. The the franchise. Yeah. How the history would be different. And the last one, because I know, and and we'll do this one. I we've talked about this one on the other on the other program, but. Um, Getting to the end of the career, I know for you it was hard. You got to make those decisions. For Rhett, it was kind of the same way. When when Rhett had his final training camp and you know he's he's off the team and you guys are on the team and you have a little team building thing. I think you guys were going out to the mountains or something. And it was all tough. It was tough not having the Rettster because the Rettster was the life of the party. Was. And you don't have the Redster with you for the first time. What was Sad. the mood like? Because th- were, were you going to Banff? Is we that what Banff. it was? We thought he was coming, and we're all sitting on the bus. I'm like, where is Red? Like, he's someone said, hey, he's not coming. We're like, what? He has to come. Like, it's not going to be fun without Red. So we're we're sitting there on the bus, and finally they said, hey, we can't wait any longer. We got to get going. So the bus takes off, and we get out. I, there's a husky. I forget almost, I can't remember Brad's Creek. Where, where is it? It'd be right, probably right by the Cochrane. Yeah, right by the there, co- yeah. yeah, right by the, and we're kind of cruising along and you see like a sign, Banff or bust. And I'm thinking, and, and this, I don't really know what's going on. They have like Daisy Dukes and like a little halter top, halter top yeah, shirt. Yeah. And you don't see the face. And I'm like, look at this idiot. I'm like, who's going to, and the bus starts pulling over. I'm like, what is going on here? Like, I'm like, keep going. Bam for no, 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 no. I'm like, we can't stop. This is a pro sports team. We're not picking up hitchhikers. We're going to get hurt here. Like bam for, and literally as we pull over, rep puts the sign down and he's there. I'm like, okay, now we're, here we go. This is going to be a good And the time. boys must just erupt oh, at that point. It went, people were going crazy. Like you just knew it was going to be, yeah. I don't know if you could do that anymore, but. Definitely, nope. uh, it was a highlight of. Uh, okay, so give us the ensemble, Rhett. You put it together. Your wife dropped you off. Is that how this one goes? Yeah, uh, it was. Well, it was. It was cowboy boots and Daisy Dukes and a halter top. <laughs> but I had the the a couple of balloons jammed in there oh, to yeah. make it look good. And yeah, I don't know if I had a cowboy hat on or not. I don't. But I also had a cooler full of booze, and I chugged a few when I stepped onto the bus. Just, I loved it. It's a classic rat. It is a classic. Oh, it's one of it a kind. A classic. You know, rat it's worked hard rat. to do that. Hard. Yeah. <laughs> but to I mean, I, to your credit, you could have you could have been hurt and sat home, mopey, or you you turn it on. Well, it was I an option. Guys... I it it was thought I, it was considered of not just going, just staying and saying, "Screw it, I'm done. This is it." I guess, but. I remember I in Chicago, really we had the Chicago series 
Yep. And right before that, Reggie got hurt. Uh, Gio got hurt. So we were down defense. I remember yeah. going to Rhett saying, because Mike Keenan asked me, what what could we do? I said, I think if we could get Rhett up this, you know, Rhett yeah. could play. You know, I remember going to Rhett. Rhett's like, you know what? I, I'll try. My shoulder's bad, but I'll try. You know, and I think the league ended up making you go to, did they make you go to New York? Yeah, they sent me to New York. Yeah. And then they didn't allow them to. Uh, <laughs> wow. To yeah. They're doctors he, now saying, you, yeah. yeah, it was a big mess yeah. too, but too he much, was gonna try I too mean, much even, weed in his bloodstream uh, no he was gonna pass try. the piss test he was he was <laughs> he was all in he said hey i'll play with one shoulder i'll do it like this will be the it is it is my greatest wow well, greatest it is one of my worst memories of hockey sitting in chicago going to a playoff game they haven't been in the playoffs forever the place was electric and having to was watch. it ever <laughs> Oh, I was, it's painful. It was awful sitting there. Awful. And that was already in Chelsea, Chelsea dagger territory, right? The beginning. Kane Taves roof coming off that place. They were just, yeah, it they were nuts. puppies. You, you could see it during the year, how good these young guys were. You're like, Keith, these guys are good. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's a, you knew it was coming and this is just the beginning. And then. You know, we jump started them, I guess. It's a few guys. There's another percentage you can chase, Connie. Yeah, yeah, we jump started them. <laughs> November 28th, it's a Monday night, 6.30 to 9.30. It is at the Saddle Dome. It is Let's Talk Hockey, the fifth, for you and Rob Kerr, the fifth, uh, the fifth year that you've done this together. And uh, there you see the details. Scotiabank Saddle Dome. Tickets available, prepprogram.ca. Follow that link. Get your tickets. Got a couple weeks here. and. You guys just sit up on, tell some stories much like this and yeah. have some fun. Nazem Kadri, Noah Hannafin, Chris Tanev, and yourself and Rob. Exactly. And then and I'm hoping uh, Chris Sutter is going to come and be with Rob and myself. Nice. Ask awesome. some question too. So special guest. There you, you go. Know, Chris does a great job. And Chris went to the prep program. So, you know, it's really a kind of a sure. say, look at that. Look, look how well Chris has done. And I think yeah. uh, it's it's special to see these the kids, to have the kids there and, and be a part of this is is well worth it. Prep Society therapeutic and educational support to children with Down syndrome, obviously, as you say, close to a lot of people within the Flames organization and uh, and beyond. So there's some details on the screen. Get your tickets, and we actually have some tickets to Ooh. give away. How do I mean? We can we can do it tomorrow. We've got some time. Well, We've got some runway. But... I feel like people are going to want to soak in this interview. Regale us with your best uh, Connie story or memory. Maybe hit us up on social. Submit something. Is that do you like that? Sure. Angle, or does that feel like too much work? It feels like a lot of work, but uh, <laughs> I don't have any better <laughs> idea right now. So, uh, so yeah. Or we could do it that way. I guess go uh, tag us with your, your favorite Connie highlight off YouTube. That's an easier one do that something or like what that. yeah that, i'm not sure that's easier either um <laughs> it's like a shot. but it's good to see you so what uh the team is in florida yeah. and you're trip. not no Jeez. so how does that work well, what's I, happening for you over the next two weeks you know i i went to the calgary canucks last night we have a lot of games now in in town so uh you know i have I some nhl that. teams some american league teams i got to catch up on those i went to the five nations yep uh, i'm going out to vancouver gonna hit the bc league this weekend and you know, there's just, it's amazing. You forget how much travel there is when you haven't been doing it with COVID sure. to, to get back into it. So it's, it's been, you know, and the delays and the flights and it's, it's a lot, but it, it's been great. It's so much better. I think to see the players live than yeah. just on video, you know, the skating, especially defense, how do they gap up? How do they do their things? So for me, it's, it's been great. And I think what well, you guys probably already know, but it's going to be a Great, great draft. That sounds like there's some mega studs and it's deep as well. It does. I'm excited. You know what? You watch players and you walk out and you thought, wow, this guy is, this guy's supposed to be in the second round or third round. I'm like any other year he's in the first round. So it's, it's a deep draft and it it should be, uh, you know, we got to dig in and make sure because we have our first and second this year as of right now. So we gotta, we gotta be ready. Imagine those BC ranks retro, like the BC Jay, when Craig Conroy comes strolling in, <laughs> oh, like strong. Elvis. If yeah. I bring Jerome, then it then it goes crazy. Is that how it goes? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Good to see you. You look good, buddy. Oh, thanks, Despite thanks, what Rhett says, I think your hair looks thanks, good. Connie. Yeah, There's I'm no shame in for sure. graying or losing well, they're hair. They're winning again. It should grow back, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I don't know about that. 
That's what I said. I'm like, I should just maybe go with like Ryan Leslie and just shave it all off. Oh, you're not there. Come on. <laughs> not there yeah. yet. Close. All right. Good stuff, buddy. Thanks. Thanks for Appreciate having your me. time. Thanks, guys. Thanks, we'll be back Ronnie. tomorrow. Well, there's Nation Every Day coming Thanks, up next Rachel. on YouTube. Oilers suck. Did Retro type?